It is. Uh, good afternoon, members. It is uh, Tuesday, March 14th, 2023, also known as Pi Day, which is 3.14159265. It is 1.30 in the afternoon. We had a longer floor session. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, members, we do have a quorum. And up first with us today, we have two proposals uh, with Senator Kupek. And I believe the first is Senate File 1522, Senator Kupek. Welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself and let's proceed. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Uh, this is Senate File 1522. Uh, this is your committee with veterans, but this is a different type of vet that we're going to be talking about. These are talking about vet techs today. Uh, so 13, uh, 1522 is a bill that would provide a voluntary pathway uh, for licensure for vet techs. Minnesota is only one of eight states in the country that do not regulate veterinary technicians. There are presently no professional requirements needed for them to work uh, in veterinary medicine jobs that include dispensing controlled substance uh, and educating the public on the health and welfare of their pets and animals. This legislation would improve veterinary practices efficiency through greater utilization of vet techs. It would recognize the education and skills that credentialed vet techs possess and will lead to improved working conditions and retention. It would improve and enhance public safety by requiring accountability and oversight with a mechanism to investigate misconduct like drug diversion. Licensed vet techs would be defined in the bill, but licensure would not be mandatory. Again, not mandatory. If a veterinarian uh, does not want to hire a licensed vet tech or vet uh, or vet, te vet technicians don't want to continue, uh, they just want to stay in their current capacity, they can. Nothing for them will change except their title. Uh, what this does do, though, is expand what vet techs can do if they are licensed. We have a growing shortage of veterinarians, particularly in the ag community and large uh, farm animals, and this would alleviate some of that shortage by allowing vet techs being, over, being supervised by a, a veterinarian uh, to do some of that, and this will help alleviate overloaded practice and help make the industry more effective. And I will, I think, for the absence of time, uh, we will skip testifiers unless you have some questions for them specifically about the bill. Thank you, Senator Kupek, and I see we have Julia Wilson with us from the Board of Veterinary uh, Medicine, and is it your contention or your, your proposal that uh, she is, you are here for questions? Correct. Thank you. Thank you very much, members. This proposal is going to leave us and go to Health and Human Services. I do believe there's a small fiscal impact, so I'd turn to our fiscal analyst for that. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Yes, there's a fiscal note for Senate File 1522. Uh, the costs that are reported in the state agents in the state government uh, area are for the Office of Administrative Hearings related to rulemaking. And as we've discussed before, these would be billed back to the agency conducting the rulemaking, so it's revenue or it's a cost neutral uh, to the state government area. Thank you very much for that, members. Are there questions for Senator Kupek or his testifier? All right, then, seeing no further questions, I will move that Senate File 1522 be recommended to pass and be re-referred re to the Committee on Health and Human Services. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And those opposed, say no. The motion is adopted. Thank, Thank you. you very, very much. Thank you for being here, um, Ms. Wilson. Up next, Senate File 1773. One. Senator Kupek, when you're ready. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senate File 1773 uh, would allow the Board of Veterinary Medicine to issue an institutional license to practice veterinary medicine at the University of Minnesota if the applicant has obtained a degree or doctorate from a non-accredited college of veterinary medicine and all other requirements are met. A person obtaining this license can only practice at the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, this allows the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine to remain competitive in acquiring top talent around the world uh, while still adhering to strict standards of medical practices. So it's just a way to, to get uh, some more people teaching and doing research in the vet tech uh, school at the University of Minnesota. With that, that is, I have people here who can answer questions if you would like, but again, we'll dispense with testimony unless there's questions. Thank you, Senator Kupek. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. 
Thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Laura Mulgard. I am a veterinarian and the dean at the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine. There is only one college of veterinary medicine in the state uh, and located right here in St. Paul. And uh, our mission is to train the next generation of veterinarians uh, and biomedical specialists to serve the state. Uh, and as you've just heard, there is a growing shortage of veterinarians and a critical workforce shortage, and it's expected to grow. So this uh, bill helps address uh, what is currently a barrier to recruiting faculty to teach uh, our veterinary students and to conduct biomedical research. And what we're asking for is uh, support to uh, remove that barrier so that we can recruit highly qualified veterinarians and specialists from international veterinary schools, uh, most of whom have done their specialty training in the United States, but currently uh, the language in the Veterinary Practice Act uh, limits our ability to recruit them because they did their under or their their professional training at an international veterinary school. Thank you very much for your testimony. There is a fiscal note in our packet, uh, and I'll turn to uh, our fiscal analyst, please. Yes, Madam Chair and members, uh, the fiscal note on this one uh, shows zero cost for all agencies involved. While I believe the bill was sent here in part because there's a reference to rules in the bill, uh, the agency does not anticipate needing to actually conduct the rulemaking, so there's no cost to any of the agencies affected by the bill. Thank you very much for that. Uh, members, this bill is going to leave this committee and head to the general, excuse me, to general orders. Um, so members, do you have questions? Senator Anderson. Madam Chair, uh, because it deals with the University of Minnesota uh, training, education, so forth and so on, shouldn't this bill uh, go on to the uh, higher education committee had to have, be, have a hearing there? And if not, why not? Uh, thank you, Senator Anderson. Uh, I understand that the, uh, the Higher Education Committee does not need to see uh, this proposal. Because? I, I'm, I'm looking at counsel because, thanks, Ms. White. Um, Madam Chair and members, I sent the bill to um, the chair of the Higher Education Committee and he indicated that he didn't need to see it and didn't give an explanation. Hmm. That's interesting that it deals with the University of Minnesota and uh, the fact that they're the only college that deals with this, that there would be some kind of imp impact on the higher education system. So uh, it's interesting that, that they would not want to see the bill and what, for what purposes that doesn't make sense. Council White. Uh, Madam Chair and members, um, Senator, I think it was because it does primarily, it deals primarily with licensing mm -hmm. and um, the Higher Education Committee doesn't get into the actual um, licensing or curriculum at the university in particular. So I think that's why the jurisdiction was waived by um, that chair. Um, Madam Chair, it, it does say I see a proof of graduation from a veterinary college and uh, Graduation, I would think, would entail the credits and all the different uh, classes that would have to be taken to be considered for veterinary, uh, to be considered for going on to veterinary college and then the information there. So, uh, but I thank you for the uh, background and appreciate the information. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Are there other questions for the author or his witness? All right, then, uh, seeing uh, no further questions, I'll move that Senate File 1773 be recommended to pass and re-referred to general orders. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. And those opposed say no. And that motion is adopted, and you are on your way. Thanks, Senator Kupek. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we will now take up uh, Senate File uh, 73, which is legislation dealing with the legalization of cannabis. Uh, I'll welcome you to the committee, Senator Port. I know uh, we have uh, an amendment. Uh, we have a number of testifiers, uh, and you have uh, been through many, many, many uh, committees at this point. Members, uh, council has prepared for us a document, or two in fact, uh, that lay out the jurisdictions of uh, what is before this committee. Um, and so I want to call that to your attention. Uh, it is important that we stay focused on the jurisdiction. 
Um, if you have questions about that, council can ask, answer those questions, but it is a handout or two handouts for you, so please refer to that, and we're going to stick with that. Um, people who are here to testify, uh, because there are a number of you, uh, we are going to limit testimony to two minutes per person. Um, we're going to stick with that as well, because we do want to get this bill with all due de deliberation through this committee uh, today. Um, and so with that, Senator Port, welcome to the committee, um, and please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Murphy and members. I am delighted to be here with you today to present Senate File 73, the Adult Use Cannabis Legalization Bill. I was very excited when I heard I would pre be presenting this bill to you on Pi Day because I am a math geek, a baker, an enjoyer of puns, and have a very helpful and supportive husband. We made mini pot pies to celebrate Pi Day. They are on the table in the back of the room, and we encourage members to uh, partake. There is no cannabis in the pot pies. They're just chicken pot pies. Uh, but we hope uh, you enjoy yourself, especially since, sen sen uh, since session went long and you probably didn't have time to grab lunch. On to Senate File 73. The prohibition of cannabis is a failed system that has not achieved the desired goals and has it had incredible costs for our communities, especially for communities of color. We have an opportunity today to continue the process to undo some of the harm that has been done and create a system of regulation that works for Minnesota consumers and businesses while ensuring an opportunity in this new market for communities that have been most affected by prohibition. Our main goals are to legalize, regulate, and expunge and we are working to ensure this bill does just that. The bill is comprehensive. It establishes an Office of Cannabis Management to oversee the regulation of cannabis products and transfers the medical cannabis program to that new office. It establishes a Cannabis Advisory Council, requires specific studies and reports, and sets up a statewide monitoring system. The bill also creates an approval process for cannabis products and hemp-derived consumer products, establishes plant propagation standards, agricultural best practices, and environmental standards. Additionally, the bill provides legal limits for adult-use cannabis products, establishes categories of licenses, and related legal framework. We establish a social equity program to ensure communities most harmed by prohibition have an opportunity to engage in the industry provide grower grants, and invest in a substance use disorder advisory council. Senate File 73 sets the tax rate for cannabis products, provides business development grant programs, sets up an automatic expungement program, as well as an expungement panel for higher level offenses, and puts in regulation changes needed for the products that we legalized last year. We also provide guidelines around testing, packaging, labeling, and advertising. As I said, this bill is comprehensive. And it will absolutely have changes from now until we hear it on the floor, as it has through this whole process. This is our 11th committee stop. We have four more to go after this. Uh, we have taken many changes and expect to continue conversations and take more through the process. Uh, we hope to continue to work together with members of both sides to create a bill that works best for Minnesotans. Today in state and local gov and veterans, the majority of the jurisdiction of this committee is in Article 1, around the creation of the Office of Cannabis Management, licensing provisions, and the interaction with local government entities. I do have a number of amendments today, including a very large rewrite of Article 1, which adjusts some of the licensing categories to take into account stakeholder feedback. It adds significant adjustments for local units of government to have more control. And I wanna say a special thank you to the cities and counties who've worked very closely with us to address their concerns. Finally, the amendment also untangles the industrial hemp industry, ensuring that the hemp industry, which is legalized federally, does not have undue burden that would harm the industry. Uh, I want to also thank the hemp farmers who have stayed in close contact with us to help us get this right. So grab a pot pie. Uh, I look forward to a fruitful discussion, and I thank the committee for your time. Thank you, Senator Port. Just a couple of questions for you process-wise. I understand that you have four more stops, including one in Texas. Is that correct? That is correct. And Senator Port, would it be uh, your uh, preferred path or the right place for any discussion about revenue sharing that that discussion happen in the tax committee? 
It, it very much would. We're still in conversations um, with the cities and counties on revenue sharing possibilities, um, but we are also still waiting for the fiscal note. Um, and so it's difficult to make monetary decisions uh, without the numbers in the bill, um, which we have continued to, to work with the agencies to get towards. Um, but our intention is that those numbers will be added in in finance or taxes, um, and taxes is where we would discuss revenue sharing. And Senator Port, just one follow-up question to that. I, I know we don't have a fiscal note in our packet yet. I know there's not a fiscal note uh, yet ready for this proposal, and I understand that there are many agencies that will be uh, impacted by this legislation when we pass it. Um, and so the fiscal note, you know, touches many jurisdictions. So do you believe that that issue is going to also be rectified or brought together in the Finance Committee? That's correct, yes. Uh, we'll take up all of the uh, finance components of the bill in the Finance Committee. All right. Um, Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. In regards to finances, this does not have a fiscal note, and uh, uh, my members are asking for finance notes to be forwarded if they're going to be moved on to the Finance Committee, to have that finance note from the committee and that we've discussed it in our committee. And if since we don't have the finance note here, which uh, a fiscal note has not been prepared for this committee, I would move to lay this bill on the table and ask for a roll call. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Senator Anderson moves to lay uh, Senate File 73 on the table and ask for a roll call vote. Roll call has been requested, and the clerk will take the roll. Chair Murphy? No. Vice Chair Mitchell? No. Lead Anderson? Yes. Senator Barr? Aye. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Swadzinski? No. Senator Dreskowski? Aye. Senator Fate? No. Senator Gustafson? Senator Jasinski? Senator Curran? Yes. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator May Quaid, can you announce your location and give me your vote? Sorry, Madam Chair. Senator McQuaid, uh, can you cast your vote? We're in location. Senator McQuaid, we'd ask that you let us know where you're at, and we're taking a vote to lay the bill on the table. Um, could you let us know where you're at and uh, how you're voting on that motion, please? My apologies, Madam Chair. I'm in St. Louis Park, um, and I uh, vote no to lay the bill on the table. Yeah. Thank you, Senator McQuaid. Senator Morrison? No. Senator Jasinski? Yes. There being uh, six ayes and seven noes, the motion is not adopted. Senator Port? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I would defer to you then if you want to go to testifiers first or if you want to uh, adopt the big amendment first, um, whichever you prefer. Uh, I think it would be wise to go to testimony, um, take the testimony, uh, move the, through that, and then we can take on the action. So I would invite uh, Alex uh, Hassel uh, from the League of Minnesota Cities, uh, and we have Glean um, McAlfresh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best here um, to follow. And as I said, uh, uh, Matt, come on up. Where are you going first? Yeah, sure. 
We're going to stick to the two-minute window. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Chair Murphy, members of the committee, good afternoon. My name is Matt Hilgart. I work for the Association of Minnesota Counties. AMC represents all of Minnesota's 87 counties. I want to thank you for the time today to speak on this most important bill. As you are probably well aware, the views of our membership are as diverse as Minnesotans' view on this topic. Uh, and that said, we have been working, uh, we have established a cannabis task force in our association for the last four years that has been reviewing the operational impacts of can potential cannabis legalization on our operations and on the clients and communities that we serve. I'll boil down the framework of the issues that we care about to three general themes. The first is local control, which in our minds means a full utilization of local government powers surrounding land use, zoning, inspection, and enforcement. The second would be supporting a strong and transparent, well-supported state regulatory framework to ensure proper license vetting, limit market oversaturation, and ensure vigor vigorous testing, quality control, and marketing standards. And the third is a rec recognition of local government costs through some sort of revenue sharing agreement. Madam Chair, I will keep my comments to that first section, as you uh, uh, pointed out earlier on. And to that point, I would say that um, we, we sincerely appreciate the author's um, openness for local government feedback. We have been meeting with Senator Port throughout this session. She's been extremely generous with her time, even meeting on this past Sunday afternoon to go over potential amendments surrounding local control. It is no secret that on behalf of the Association of Minnesota Counties, our counties, if legalization does proceed, would want an opt-in or opt-out clause like many states that have done this do. Um, that is not being considered at this time, but in lieu of that, we are extremely grateful for hopefully uh, an amendment coming forth today that will lay out a strong framework surrounding um, potential limitations on the total number of cannabis retailers, as well as we think a very powerful tool in terms of a local land use compatibility statement that we've seen other states use. So to those two points, we want to thank Senator Port and we'll um, continue to be remain uh, engaged in conversations. Thank you, Mr. Hilgart. And I, I just want to make sure that for the people who are here with us, we will be taking up an amendment. It has been, all the amendments have been posted, so they are available for public view and we will be taking them up and discussing them. Thank you very much. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Alex Hassel. I'm here on behalf of the League of Minnesota Cities. Uh, our comments today really fit into the context of how cities and local governments really want to be partners with the state uh, in the regulatory framework for adult use cannabis. Um, we want to thank Senator Port for her openness to discussing local government's role in, uh, in this and adding uh, local registrations to the bill potentially today. Uh, and that will be an incredibly important tool for local governments uh, to ensure that they can respond really quickly if issues arise with a retailer. Um, that'll be incredibly important. Those cities have been asking to have regulatory authority through licensing. Uh, we think that this uh, reg uh, registration process will bring local governments in a meaningful way into this process. Um, we also see this as being helpful to the Cannabis Management Board. Enforcing uh, this statewide will be a tall task, and so we're really happy to be partners as local governments in that process. We'd also like to uh, uh, say thank you for the, the discussion on adding local zoning approval and uh, potential limits to licenses, uh, as uh, I think that discussion and amendments will happen today. Throughout this process, cities have been sharing their concerns, not in opposition to the legalization of cannabis, but in recognition that cities need some local control and to ensure that these products follow local zoning and land use laws, just as any other industry would be required. Um, and while cities uh, also have been requesting the authority to opt out of retail license, which would follow the examples of other states, um, we're glad to see this discussion go forward on potentially limiting uh, at least the number of lim uh, retailers in a jurisdiction. And that'll be helpful, especially in cities that might be in areas that are advantageous for the market, like near the border of other states, uh, and making sure that they're not overburdened with more retailers and they, they can uh, reasonably manage. So um, I'll just mention that the remaining piece that we are hoping to continue working on uh, is that related to revenue sharing. We understand that that will be uh, on uh, going discussions as other committees approach. So um, I'll just say thank you again to Senator Port uh, and that we look forward to continuing to work together. Thank you very much. And I want to thank both of you and Mr. Hilgert for uh, your clarity about this from the very beginning and your persistent work with Senator Port and others. Um, and I'm grateful that you're here and sharing your testimony today. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Welcome to the committee. Please you. introduce yourself for the record and proceed. 
Absolutely, Chair Murphy. Chair Murphy, committee members, and Senator Port, thank you for allowing me to speak on SF73 today. My name is Glenn McAlfresh, and I'm the co-founder of Plift, a hemp drive beverage company currently operating in Minnesota. I respectfully disagree with the author's position that this amendment removes unnecessary burdens on hemp businesses. The current version of SF73, even with the author's amendment if adopted today, will close hundreds of Minnesota businesses on July 1st, 2023. Starting at line 29.6 in the A98 amendment, it states that upon enactment on July 1st, 2023, no person may sell cannabinoid products without a license. The only authority to issue those licenses is the Office of Cannabis Management, but the effective date establishing the office is also July 1st, 2023. Although I have a deep appreciation of the work of government officials, there's no world in which I could foresee that hundreds of businesses will be processed and receive their license in a one-day time frame. This puts businesses like ours who are currently selling low-potency TH edibles in a catch-22. We're forced to choose between breaking the law to continue selling these products or shuttering our business until some much later date when the office is established. I haven't found a low-potency THC edible company that would illegally sell low-dose THC products. Everyone would shut down their business or move to another state. Minnesota is uniquely the most socially equitable and pro-business cannabis market I've ever seen in my 10 years of cannabis industry experience. Individuals who have been arrested for petty cannabis crimes, their lives inexorably changed by the war on drugs, can start a low-potency THC edible business today. Businesses with experience producing food and beverage products at scale, such as craft breweries and bakeries, uh, are currently making low-dose THC products and meeting the overwhelming consumer demand. For the last year, we've seen a booming market and consumers have grown to love buying these low-potency THC edibles and drinks. We recognize that the lower potency THC edible market needs more regulation and transparency, including, but not limited to, who is making and selling these products, what's in them, and enforcement mechanisms to punish bad actors. However, regulating hemp-derived cannabinoids with marijuana-derived cannabinoids is not the solution. Madam Chair, members, Senator Port, thank you once again for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your testimony and your, uh, your succinctness. Uh, Mr. Egan and Mr. Milkey, if you're present, I believe the first, Mr. Egan is virtual. Yes, ma'am. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. I appreciate the time. Uh, my name is Stephan Egan. I am a combat veteran five times over. Deployed uh, multiple multiple times with Joint Special Operations Command as a counterintelligence special agent. Uh, through that time, I have been shot, blown up, um, and almost died a few times. Uh, with that being said, cannabis has provided me a way back uh, to society, a way back to being a functional human being. And fortunate enough for me, my experience has allowed me to, an unfortunate pathway to be in, to gaining access to medical cannabis. Now that's not to say the same for all my brothers and sisters in arms. Um, some of them simply just don't qualify for the programs that we have. Some of them simply cannot afford the programs that we have. So allowing uh, recreational cannabis would allow veterans specifically to gain access to better their lives and be functioning humans and functional members of society. With that all being said, I'm currently now the Director of Scientific Applications and Research and Development for a cannabis operator uh, that works globally. We manufacture extraction refinement equipment and set up pharmaceutical grade labs all around the world. Unfortunately, I have to travel all around the world in order to provide for my family when we can simply do it here in Minnesota. Another unfortunate instance within our state, we've allowed uh, synthetic cannabinoids to uh, take hold of the market, uh, providing unsafe products to consumers potentially because there's no data, there is no proper SOPs or uh, workups provided to the labs for proper testing for residual contaminants, residual catalysts, or the acids used to make these products. We've simply allowed that by laws passed within the state when we're, where we're straight denying access to the real plant that people should have access to. With that said, I know that there's, there's gaps within this bill, uh, but just like any other law, we, we pass the law and we fill the gaps as needed, and it's crucial. Uh, the, the, the citizens of Minnesota absolutely need, need this access. We need the, the revenue internally. Uh, people need to feel like they're in control of their lives and giving them access to the plant would do just that. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Egan, and for your service. Mr. Milkey. All right. Uh, Mike Golick.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the committee. Introduce Thank yourself you. and proceed. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Mike Golick. I'm CEO and owner of Natrium Hemp Wellness in St. Louis Park. I'm also a disabled vet. When I joined the military, it was because of 9-11. Um, I was attached to the Reuben James FG, FFG 57, where I was deployed four years and three months out of a five-year contract. At that time, I uh, conducted Operation Enduring Freedom. I uh, also went to South America and Central, Central America for uh, drug operations. Um, I'm fully aware of how the power of the black market works uh, in conjunction with cartels. So uh, my service uh, pretty much can provide all the information needed if there's any other questions beyond that. And at, at Natrium, we specialize in uh, minor cannabinoids and THC products. We specialize with helping those who struggle with mental illness and pain management. I myself struggle with PTSD and can emphasize enough how much these products have helped me. I've witnessed my mother denied access to THC for help in her pain management when she died of cancer. My sister was a victim of a hit job from the cartels, still being under investigation, <clears throat> as well as the uh, war on drugs from my military service. Obviously, this has impacted all the people that I know, love, and served with. I firmly believe that Minnesota is making the right move by hearing small business owners first. If we are to operate in alliance with the community, we must allow Minnesota first before outsider influence. As a veteran, I can assure you that I have personally taken charge and taken the high road by checking product that comes into my store daily and making sure that they're panel approved. Please know that there are players in this game that want to help the community move with, move with integrity, honor those who trust our knowledge in this industry. As I've taken an oath to this constitution, I still live by that oath. I also take an oath to provide consumers with the utmost integrity and honor with the best product possible. I ask that we limit uh, heavy taxing as, we, as it will keep the illegal market alive. And let us not repeat what some of our failing fellow states have done over taxing and over regulating, such as Illinois, California. Cannabinoids are the future of healthy Minnesota, and I thank you for taking the time to hear my story. Thank you very much for your testimony today and for your service. Uh, I'd like to ask Kyle Mar Marinkovich. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kyle Marinkovich, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Northern Diversified Solutions, located in Burnsville. Uh, we have the good fortune of being in Senator Port's uh, district, and we thank her for all her efforts on this bill. I'm here to voice my support for Senate File 73. We process hemp biomass into cannabinoid ingredients for uses in a wide variety of applications. I also serve on the board of directors of the Minnesota Hemp Growers Cooperative, and I'm a member of the MN is Ready Coalition. I founded NDS in 2019 after spending 14 years at Cargill, leading commercial activities in a variety of specialty ingredient and specialty supply chains across the globe. I had the privilege of working with amazing people from the farm gate to the consumer and gained extensive commercial, technical, and management experience. I founded NDS to bring this experience to the cannabis industry, to build a high-performing, highly skilled team right here in Minnesota that serves customers from the upper Midwest to the East Coast, utilizing exclusively Minnesota-grown hemp and processed in the South Metro. We have invested over $1 million building these capabilities and by employing individuals from agronomy and chemistry backgrounds to construction and skilled trades, to business and food science. We are grateful for the state's continued support of the cannabis industry. As an example, we were fortunate to be able to participate in DEED's Angel Tax Credit Program and Angel Loan Fund, which was foundational in our ability to hire, train, and retain a team of five full-time and six part-time employees to date. We expect to add three additional employees this year including a STEM intern this summer through Minnesota's SciTech program. These are all great paying, highly skilled local jobs for the benefit of Minnesota's economy and its future. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and voice support for SF73. 
Thank you so much for your testimony and Thank for you. being here today. Uh, next, I'll invite Linda Stanton to join us. And I will acknowledge that the alarm that is going off is the alarm that wakes me up in the morning sometimes, and so it can be jarring. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the committee. Thank Please you. introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you. My name is Linda Stanton. Thank you for listening to my testimony today. It is the goal of cannabis bill to make it safe. Certainly legal products would not be laced with fentanyl and heroin. That's good. But the fact is that THC would still be harmful in and of itself. Regulations would only give a false sense that the situation is less dangerous if passed. Think about unintended consequences. In legal states, cartels just switched to bring in harder drugs. The state would be creating a new addictive drug industry dominated by big tobacco and others for profit, the birth of big marijuana. Just be honest, the red light would switch to green and kids, the most vulnerable group to abuse drugs, would think it's okay to use, not knowing the serious risks and harms of cannabis and THC. It's not alcohol, nor is it tobacco. I've heard testimony from parents, read opinions from MDs and professionals, even the FDA warns about its use. In an opinion piece from, from April 2021, <clears throat> Robert Corey, who helped, develop, who helped draft Colorado's 2012 ballot amendment states, I wish I could be proud of what we created, but I'm not. The outcome is shameful, hurts people, and Colorado is not safer. What I have changed my mind on, Corey goes on, which I was too naive to anticipate 10 years ago, is the wisdom of a commercialized, for-profit, elitist, government-protected, privileged, monopolistic industry that per perpetuates itself and obs its obscene profits to the detriment of the public good and the planet Earth. The industry genetically modifies plants at a level that would make Monsanto blush. The process taxes the power grid, polluting water, all to artificially grow plants, to genetically engineer high THC levels in football field-sized warehouses. I urge you to vote no. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today and for being here. Appreciate that. Uh, next is Colette Gayette Hempel. And following that will be Mr. Neumeister. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chairperson Murphy. My name is Colette Guyatt Hempel. I live in Brooklyn Park, the sixth largest city in the state of Minnesota. I am devastated by this bill. I have a degree from the University of Minnesota from 1984 when addiction behaviors talked about marijuana all the way back then. And the strength of this marijuana now is devastating. The recent surveys have, have proven that, that mental health issues such as paranoia is quite common. There is a four times increase in schizophrenia. This is one of the most serious mental illnesses there, there is in the planet, period. And to promote a drug, that causes that is devastating. I live, Brooklyn Park is right next door to Osseo. For those of you that don't know about the party bus incident, 150 people went into a park in Osseo that has a walloping seven to 10 police officers total. They needed five police departments to help them um, retain and get five guns out of the environment and as well as uh, senior citizens were having these people come urinate right in front of their front windows. The smoke from the marijuana was going into their homes. When you have two ounces of marijuana that's the same as 56 joints. That's enough for 14 people to get high on the spot. What are you gonna do about the state fair? What are you gonna do about the Three Rivers parks? What about city parks? 
Yes, you've got it for schools not to have it, but these places and Morris, a college town right 30 miles from where I grew up in Benson, no longer has a police department as of this coming January. I'm going to ask you with to wrap the university up, uh, and, and all of those students. There are no five police agencies in that county. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to wrap up now. But thank you. I really appreciate your testimony. Thank you for being here. Mr. Neumeister. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Rich Neumeister. I also ask that a handout be done. All I want in, in, in this, with this bill as it implemented, clean, fair, and ethical cannabis business. I am not interested in cronyism, favoritism, and malfeasance that's happened in other states. Now, with that in mind, because this is going to be a regulate, at, right off the start, a half a billion dollar industry. That's what I see with work I've done. So let's go to page 16, line 15, through line 16 through 22 on the amendment. The director. The way the director, the qualifications, criteria for this director is zip. There's nothing. The only criteria serves at the pleasure of the governor. To me, it's laughable. So I would encourage that this group, which is under your jurisdiction, jurisdiction put some meat on those bones. Other states do it. Give some direction. And it is very important for you and for the public. Secondly, let's take a look at the advisory board on page 17 through 21. It has no enforcement, has no authority. But in other states, such as New York, Washington, and Vermont, there is a shared cannabis board, management board, or within control board, whatever you want to call it, that shares some of the management. I would like to see that type of model. Now let's get to the n another one, conflict of interest, financial interest. There is businesses throughout the country. This has been an issue. We have weak and anemic laws with conflict of interest. If you take a look on page 1632 and 1714, it talks about financial interest. Financial interest is defined in rule, not in statute. And secondly, you're repealing that. So I say put it in statute. You, what you have passed out is what New York offers as I think a robust and strong conflict of interest. And on the last point, Madam Chair, I believe, as I start, stated in this, this is going to be a big industry. It's going to be a lot of things. Let's have some type of internal audit, IG, or something with some kind of independence authority that they can do some things about this broad industry that then I can do, the public can do things. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I thank you very much. I think it's very direct and pointed what I've shared with you today. Mr. Neumeister, I believe this is your first visit to our committee this cycle, and I'm glad to have you here. Thank you. Uh, Carol Moss, and then Ted Galati. Ms. Moss, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Carol Moss. I'm a partner at Helmuth & Johnson Law Firm, representing a number of businesses in this industry. I also proudly serve on the board for the National Association for the Women Business Owners Minnesota chapter, the oldest chapter in the country. I'm here to ask you that as you work with local municipalities, to consider the difficulties we've had in the past year since the last July, and have it in Denver for an even playing field across the state. Since July, many cities passed licensing ordinances for the sale of hemp-derived products. But through these processes, we found licensing ordinances to be drastically different from city to city, creating difficulties and confusions for businesses and consumers. For example, many cities reasonably followed their tobacco license and zoning for the sale of THC, such as 500 feet from the school. Other cities went well beyond what they set their limits for for tobacco and, and liquor, setting limits of 1,000 feet as the crow flies, property line to property line, from schools, daycare, and playgrounds. One city even concluded a 1,000 feet restriction from any place that provides drug and alcohol treatment. 
even though they had no such restrictions on any of their liquor licenses. I had a client who was denied a license to sell hemp drive THC, which he had been selling legally for the past couple of years, because a daycare opened after he had opened his store. That daycare was 950 feet away. It was over a four lane road, over a gas station, facing the other way. And because he was not um, able to get a THC uh, license to sell the product he had been selling for two years, he will likely close shop. Another issue is the uh, varying licensing fees. Some cities charge 500 to 750, two suburbs charge 10,700, making it difficult for smaller businesses to participate. These are just two examples of the difficulties we've had with the hodgepodge of local ordinances. And we ask that as we work with local municipalities uh, that we keep that consideration in mind and work towards a even playing field. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Hello, my name is Ted Galati. I want to thank you for having me here to hear my voice. I am the owner operator of Willis Keep Farm and we run Hemp Maze, Minnesota and Canada Disc Golf Course in Zimbrota, Minnesota. We also own the Old Pine Theater in Pine Island, Minnesota and we are expanding to Hagger City with Sacred Mounds Farm, another hemp farm and retail spot. Why am I here? Well, this bill has hemp listed 363 times in it. That's why I'm here. The bill doesn't need to have hemp in it. We have the farm bill, the 2018 farm bill. You're all familiar with that. That makes hemp legal. Anything below Delta 9 THC 0.3%. We also have the 151.72, which allows us to sell CBD and cannabis products, including low potency THC in the state. Local control, let's talk about that. The League of Minnesota Cities, what is that? That's a lobbying group, isn't it? They bring in $700,000 a year to lobby and to push you guys in directions that maybe I don't want you to go or other cities don't want you to go. But they've worked with my city, Pine Island, to have Ordinance 164. Now I must get a license to sell any of my CBD products even if they don't have THC in it. Now, to me, they can also deny, they can deny my license, they can, they can um, do background checks, which I'm already doing a background check with Minnesota Department of Ag. They can also do a financial check. They can also revoke this license at any time, and they can also deny it to anyone for any reason at any time. That's local control. Now, on top of that, we've got Article 1, Section 13, if this bill goes through, I will not be able to have CBD sold out of my theater because I'm 1,000 feet from this, I'm actually 575 feet from the school. However, the American Legion's 100 feet from the school. And you know what? The municipal, municipal bar, which is now the sports bar, is 200 feet from the school. Why is that allowed? That's poison. That can kill a child. I'm not saying I want kids to get their hands on THC, but I'm, I just don't understand why we treat it differently. Now, the other thing, importation. We have this importation declaration now. I have a farm in Wisconsin. How am I gonna transport my products over the bridge from Red Wing into Minnesota to sell it, or vice versa out? We need to look at this bill. We need to really look at this bill. If we just push it through without looking at this bill, it's gonna drastically affect hemp farmers, hemp retailers, myself, my family, my employees. I just employed somebody yesterday, another person. We're gonna ask you Thank to Thank you very up, much please. for your time. But please, please, I urge you to look at this bill and possibly take hemp out of the bill. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony and for being here again today. I appreciate that. Uh, David Benson Stabler and then John Barty. I believe Mr. Benson Stabler is virtual. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Murphy. Speaking today as a registered lobbyist of C, the Minnesota C4, and ANC, the Minnesota Anti-Narcotic and Anti-Drug Coalition, uh, about a major constitutional infeasibility problem with the regulatory scheme, uh, which the current amendment today doesn't address. In 1906, Minnesota voters responded to the case of State v. Jensen. The conviction of a melon grower for selling without a license was upheld with passage of Article 13, Section 7, as currently numbered, which restricts the power to make laws policing of society the selling of lawfully grown, of lawful 
grown products that the seller grew. Under this amendment, for example, one can raise livestock and if complying with the substantive rules of butchering, sell the meat without a license to sell meat. State the Hartman. But there's a line at which the processing is significant enough under the Minnesota Supreme Court rulings that selling the product would no longer be exempt. So the primary question is, where would the Minnesota Supreme Court draw that line of a significant change from a raw product uh, for cannabis in terms of this exemption applying? In practical terms, for state and local governments in Minnesota, suspected unlicensed sellers would unscrupulously get wise to, I grew this being equivalent to open sesame, as police or investigators would almost entirely be unable to take the line of inquiry, inquiry further because search activity requires standards of credible belief that evidence against the defense presented could be obtained. How would you prove where a plant was grown when, some, when someone has harvested it? Additionally, the Dormant Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution restricts states from giving in-state advantages to cannabis businesses. Mr. Uh, Vincent Stabler, I'm going to ask you to wrap up, As recently decided in New York, Verisite case. This bill would massively increase the use of THC, an addictive drug, in the state of Minnesota. Mr. Benson, Mr. Benson Stabler, I'm going to ask you to wrap up, please. You've been Thank you very much. The usage would at least triple based on the hard data from all the other states. The industry prides itself on users maturing, as they call it, in every state. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. My name is John Barti. I'm a lobbyist for Uniflora Holistics and a board member of the Minnesota Cannabis College. I'd like to thank you all and Thank you, Senator Port, for carrying this bill. I'd, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to remind the members that cannabis is currently an Ill illicit industry here in Minnesota that is worth billions of dollars, and that bringing this industry to the light is not easy work. So I commend you all for the work and Senator Port and her co-authors. I got into this activity because of the over-policing and senselessness of cannabis prohibition. When Philando Castile was killed in front of his family, I felt moved to do my part to end the criminalization of cannabis. This is what this bill is about, giving, back, giving people back freedom they should have never lost. I recently got to spend time with Cameron Taylor, one of the 60,000 Minnesotans who will qualify for expungement under this bill. Cameron expressed his story in a recent Star Tribune article. His journey as a father, friend, and pawn of prohibition, showing all the trouble it has brought him despite serving his time. Though the adult use industry will get all the headlines, Minnesota, Minnesotans like Cameron are who this bill has always been about. Cannabis prohibition has not been a serious policy. It has ruined lives, families, and communities while giving Minnesotans nothing in return. Now with this opportunity to bring an end to, bring an end to prohibition, we must remember justice, remember the, ca the casualties of prohibition, and try to craft a bill that works for every and all Minnesotans. Um, I, I really am just asking you all to remember that we have looked at this, we have demonized what we are talking about for decades. So this is not just legalization. It's trying to flip the way we look at things here in this state and see what is now acceptable and what can we build on and how can we bring along the people that we've held back with the same policies. So thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you very much, Mr. Barty. Uh, the last person I have on the list is Mr. Marcus Harkis. And I invite you to join us. Welcome to the committee. Please Good introduce yourself for the record and proceed. My name is Marcus Harkis. I'm the community relations manager for Uniflora Holistics, Minnesota's most loving cannabis company. I've been lobbying for full legalization since 2014, so I understand the full picture of the many intersectional issues related to cannabis. 
I've heard pro-legalization legislators that prohibition has done more harm than good, but there's actually been no good accomplished by criminalizing people over this healing plant. The most dangerous thing about cannabis is getting caught with it. And the bottom line is that prohibition is the problem, not cannabis. I've heard legislators say the main purpose of ending prohibition is to eliminate the illicit market, but that's not true either. The illicit market, which is run by a lot of good people who respect how this healing plant makes us feel better, only exists because of the senseless, unjust, and structurally racist prohibition of cannabis. The real reason law enforcement lobbies fight against legalization with misinformation is because they're addicted to the drug war and all the money that comes with criminalizing people over a victimless farce of a crime. The real purpose of ending prohibition is to stop criminalizing Minnesotans over cannabis because we're supposed to live in a free country, not a corrupt and oppressive police state. I've been working to see full legalization come to our state for nine years, and I'm excited that this will be the last. <laughs> Given that will be the 22nd state, we must learn from the 21 states that have gone before us to establish the best model in the nation, one that is equitably regulated, reasonably taxed, and justly repairs prohibition victims. Senate File 73 has a lot of very good provisions, but unfortunately, it's also prohibition light in terms of the plentiful space allowed to continue criminalizing and discriminating against Minnesotans over cannabis. Equity and justice as it relates to Minnesota effectively redressing the unjust harms of prohibition looks like expunging and vacating records, especially felonies, and setting up the OCM to support a development of a thriving, diverse, small business-oriented craft cannabis market that disproportionately includes communities that have been disproportionately criminalized by prohibition. As an African-American man who has experienced excessive racial profiling, including police harassment over the abuse, over the smell of cannabis, I'm intimately familiar with the stark racial disparities and rest over it. I understand the constitutional prohibition on racial preference and licensing, so the best way for us to see racial equity in Minnesota's emerging legal cannabis industry is to set low barriers to entry and provide pathways for good actors in the illicit market to cross over to do business legally. I'm going to ask you to wrap up, Mr. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Harkis. Please move Senate File 73 forward and let's improve it before it becomes law this year. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony and for your years of work. <laughs> Senator Port. Ms. Fate. We have, um, you know, just a few minutes left in the committee, and we can go until about a quarter to at the latest. So I am anticipating that we are going to come back this evening, uh, members, uh, so that we are able to deliberately act on this piece of legislation. So I would anticipate that we will reconvene after we recess uh, at around 5:30 uh, after the afternoon committees are done, and we'll be back in this. We'll be back in this room. Um, but it would be uh, useful, I think, if we could uh, move, you know, attempt to move your amendments and get the bill into the shape that we're going to take it up uh, when we come back this afternoon, uh, late this afternoon. So, Senator Port, uh, could you um, let us know the order of the amendments that you'd like to act upon? Yeah, I'd like to start with the A98. All right, members, as I said, this is an amendment that was posted. It is uh, a significant amendment. Uh, it is in your packets. Uh, and I will um, uh, move the A98 amendment so it is before us. Uh, and Senator Port, if you and your witness would want to walk us through the amendment, we'd be grateful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm happy to walk through it and um, point out the things that are different because uh, it is a rewrite of Article 1. So some of it stays the same um, and some of it changes. And so I'm happy to do that sort of section by section. Um, section one is the definition section. It does add some relevant definitions and references uh, new licensing for the untangling of hemp and the addition of a mezzo business, which is sort of the medium-sized license that is being added in this. Uh, sections two through nine stay identical to the bill. Uh, section 10 has to do with licensing types, uh, adds in here the cannabis meso business uh, and lower potency hemp manufacturers, lower potency hemp edible retailer licenses are all added. 
Um, number uh, section 11 is on the fees for those licenses. Uh, those are established in that section. Uh, section 12 is license transfer language, which allows for the transfer of license. Um, but if you have a social equity license, uh, you have to, you must go to social equity applications, applicants. We don't want uh, those to sort of be able to be easily pulled out of the community. We are trying to be sure to engage in this. Uh, number section 13 is around local control. It allows for the dual registration uh, for cities and counties to have stronger uh, local control protections. Section 14 is license application renewal and fees, which eliminates the requirement that a physical location already be possessed in order to apply um, and eliminates an optional diversity plan included in the application. 15 is the same as it was before. Uh, 16 is license selection criteria. Uh, there will be an additional amendment to this portion uh, if we adopt the A98. Uh, sections 17 through 20 are identical. Section 21 is on cannabis cultivator licenses and it combines uh, cultivator license and operations into one section. Uh, rather than split into multiple places. Uh, section 22 is for retailers. Uh, this is the dual licensing uh, regulation space. Uh, section 23 is uh, record keeping, uh, allowing for the sale of Office of Cannabis Management approved cannabis and products. Uh, Section 24 combines the cannabis manufacturer license and operation sections into one and adds size limitations to align with the mezzo business side limitations. Section 25 requires cultivation records, plan, and agricultural compliance. Uh, it is simply moved to this location to keep it. It was in a different portion of the bill, but it's been moved to keep all those portions together. Section 26 addresses new manufacturing requirements tied to the hemp untangling and requires notice of volatile chemical use. Uh, much of this, again, isn't new language, just moved into Article 1. Section 27 combines retailer license and business operations into one section. Section 28 lays out requirements for meeting packaging and labeling requirements. Section 29 adds in or, or changes uh, the micro business canopy limit from 2,000 up to 5,000 square feet. Uh, 30, section 30 stays the same. Uh, section 31 lays out the new mezzo business license. Uh, 5,000 square feet canopy up to 15,000 square feet canopy uh, by rule. Sections 32 through 42 are the same. Uh, section 43 establishes low potency hemp edible manufacturer and retail license. Section 44 stays the same. Section 45 processes for hemp business license. Uh, that those are established through the hemp licensing, by rule through the hemp licensing process. Uh, section 46 is lower potency hemp edible license. Section 47 is uh, the medical cannabis cultivator. There is a change allowing for a larger canopy size to be grandfathered in for the current medicals to meet the needs um, of our medical community. Sections 48 and 49 are the same. Uh, actually, uh, all the way through 60 are the same. Uh, in, section 61 is on packaging. Uh, there is a minor, exception, a minor change to this for childproof containers for beverages. Uh, there is, in section 63, oh, that's the same, sorry. Uh, 64 and 65 are the same. Uh, section 66, uh, hemp-derived trop topical products must meet labeling requirements now. Um, and all of the rest of the section 67 through 74 are the same as what was current in the bill before. It's a big amendment, but it's mostly a rewrite uh, adding in those changes. Thank you, Senator Port. Members, I'd like us to move the amendment so we can get the bill into the shape that we'd like it. Are there questions? We will be, of course, uh, having plenty of time for questions and examination. 
All right, so then uh, uh, the A98 before us, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those opposed aye. say no. Thank you. And those opposed say no. no. And that motion is adopted. Senator Port, do you have other amendments? Yes, uh, I have the, well, Senator Gustafson has the A103. Thank you, Senator Port. Senator Gustafson has the A103. And we'll get that distributed uh, with a copy to the bill's author. And Senator Gustafson, while it's being distributed, are you prepared to describe the amendment? I am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the A98 amendment has language that allows for dual registration, allowing local governments, local units of government to be part of the regulation of retailers. The system gives local units of government the authority to temporarily pull a registration for compliance concerns or immediate concerns around public health or safety, and the Office of Cannabis Management must respond swiftly to make further determination about the retailer's license. Um, the A103 I'm offering goes further in local control by allowing cities, counties, towns, and townships to limit the number of retailers in the community within reason, uh, requires retailers to obtain a land use certification. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Um, Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Gustafson, thank you for bringing this amendment. This has been ongoing conversations we've been having with cities and counties, um, and I know that members have been having with their own cities and counties. Uh, this is a friendly amendment. We encourage uh, the passing of it. Senator Port and Senator Gustafson, uh, Council White has an oral amendment to the amendment. Council White. Uh, Madam Chair, members, this is just a technical amendment correcting a cross-reference on page one, line nine. Delete 342.215 and insert 342.22. Senator Gustafson, uh, would you be willing to incorporate that into your amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, then we have before us the A103, uh, which Senator Gustafson has moved and has described. Members, are there questions on this amendment? And seeing no questions, uh, Senator Gustafson moves the A103 amendment uh, with the incorporated oral amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. And those opposed aye. say Thank you. And those opposed say no. No. And that amendment is adopted. Senator Port. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have the A99. We will have that amendment distributed. Senator Port, would you like to describe the A99? I'll move the A99. Would you like to describe it? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, this is um, language that we've been working on with Americans for Prosperity to help ensure that we have um, strong market compliance and strong market analysis to determine whether we are fulfilling the requirements and the goals of this bill. Um, we appreciate their input um, on this language, and I think we've gotten it to a place where we're ready to incorporate it. So I would encourage uh, members to include this in the bill. Thank you, Senator Port. Members, does everybody have the amendment? Are there questions on the A99 amendment that is before you? Seeing no questions, then uh, I'll move the A99 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And those aye. opposed? Thank you. And those opposed, say no. No. And the amendment is adopted. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have the A100. The A100 amendment being distributed now. Senator Port, do you want to describe the amendment? And we'll make sure members have it before we consider it. Yes, this is language that um, allows for the um, 
the Office of Cannabis Management to permit variants. Um, part of what we know will happen with setting up a new industry is we don't know exactly what supply needs will be. We don't know what the demand will be. So as we build in you know, our best guesses um, based on what other states have learned around canopy size, around retail locations, things like that, we don't actually know until we get up and running um, how successful those operations will be and how they will meet d the demand. So this puts in language to allow the office um, to, to, through rulemaking, allow some variance uh, to meet the market need. Thank you, Senator Port. Uh, the A100 before us, members, other questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. This sounds really, uh, when you, uh, Senator Port, you say you don't know what's going to happen. This reminds me of what happened on the national level where you don't know what's in the bill until you pass it. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, was that a question? Well, I'm just, uh, you're, you're, you're making assumptions on this, this uh, bill and and you don't know what this, this is going to uh, re re resolve or, or uh, take on as a, a form. So I'm just concerned that we're, we're doing things that we don't know what we're doing. And uh, we're, we're basically flying by the seat of our pants. And I'm concerned. Thank you. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I will say, uh, as at my 11th committee stop, this does not feel to be flying by the seat of its pants. Um, and I... We continue to work with stakeholders. This is one area where we can't know uh, what market demand will be uh, in an industry that does not exist in our state at this point. So we are making sure to put in the ability for the office to, to work within uh, the realities of the industry as it begins to set up. Thank you, Senator Port. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Port, how many states have legalized cannabis now? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Anderson, I believe it's 22. And Madam Chair, S Senator, Senator Port, have you contacted any of those states to find out how this particular amendment would affect their particular state? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Anderson. I haven't talked with them specifically about the lines in this amendment, but this is work that actually was suggested to us from many of the states that we are talking to. Um, I spend significant time talking with legislators in other states uh, who have gone through this process to make sure that we are learning lessons from them. And one of the lessons that they told us, many of them told us they learned, is that they were overly prescriptive in the bill and did not leave opportunities for um, the office or agency or department in whatever case uh, to make adjustments based on market realities, uh, which left them with either oversupply or undersupply, um, both of which can be detriments to the market. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Port. You talked about stakeholders and being involved, and from the information I'm seeing, it's, it's basically Minnesota is ready is the one that's, that's organizing all this. And, and I had a stakeholder that wanted to give some input, but they were given a sheet that said, uh, you have to pay basically to give input. So there's suggested donation donation levels of ten thousand dollars, twenty five thousand, ten thousand, twenty five thousand, fifty thousand from a non Minnesota business. So it seems to me this is pretty much a pay to play type uh, group of, of if you want to get input on the bill, you can pay to to give your input. Is that an accurate statement, or are you you're talking to people that don't have to pay to give input in, on the stakeholders? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Jasinski. Um, I am not a part of MN is Ready. I certainly work with them and their entire coalition, uh, but I have taken, my LA was here, she would have probably the exact number, but my guess is between 80 and 100 meetings uh, on this bill uh, from all sorts of stakeholders. Uh, my Legislative assistant uh, has a block of meetings every week uh, where I take back to back to back meetings for four and a half hours uh, to make sure we're getting through uh, everyone. I, I, I don't screen those meetings based on whether they agree with me or not uh, or whether they're moving that. I am, I've been very conscious to take as many meetings as possible, including uh, as we met yesterday, and I appreciate your time. Uh, meetings with the minority party uh, before each committee stop to ensure that we have opportunity to to include input as well. 
Senator okay. Jasinski. And thank you, Mr. And I know Minnesota Ready's are Ms. Fate. So is it, I mean, are you taking input from people who don't pay, or is it just the people that pay that get to have input from your side then? You know, like, uh, introduce yourself for the record, please, and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. My name is Laylee Fadahi. I'm the campaign manager for MN is Ready. We are the state's largest and most diverse coalition of cannabis policy stakeholders. Uh, and we have been doing hundreds and hundreds of hours of stakeholder consultation to produce uh, substantive recommendations uh, on ways to improve this bill. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Jasinski, uh, the campaign does not require a contribution in order for people to participate. As that document says, those are suggested donation levels. We have many people that are participating actively in the coalition, including on the advisory board in the course of these working groups that we've been convening without having made any contribution. We have businesses that make as little as you know, $50 contribution. We have individuals that contribute. We have nonprofit organizations uh, that contribute several without uh, contribution in. And also the process by which we elicited uh, input into the bill. We have a form that has been circulated publicly Anybody can submit their recommendation for uh, change or an idea to the legislation, um, and that has all been incorporated then into, into the stakeholder engagement process for producing these recommendations. So, um, no, I mean, it is, it is a statewide diverse campaign, but like all campaigns, we have some expenses that we fundraise for. Senator. And thank you, Madam Chair. So again, I'm getting conflicting reports on that because I did have some stakeholders who were trying to get involved and basically were told they had to pay uh, to do that. So it, can you uh, give me an example of someone who didn't pay the $10,000 that got input on the bill that, that substantially changed it, or is it just minor tweaks? Or Because uh, again, what I'm hearing is that's not correct, that the, the people that are not paying don't get any substantial changes to the bill and are not being heard. So I would just ask what, what substantial changes has anybody who's not been a, a donor of 10000 or $25,000 been made that has, we've seen in an amendment or something like that here? Ms. Fadahey. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Jasinski, again, majority of the members of the coalition are paying nowhere near that um, amount. There are plenty of testifiers even in the room today that spoke to the legislation. Um, I'll, I, I'm not comfortable disclosing um, how much different uh, members of the coalition contribute because it is a sliding suggested amount. Um, but if any of them want to disclose that information to you, they're certainly welcome to. Thank you, Madam Chair. Then just last comment that I'll just say that the, the sheet I had, the, the minimum suggested amount was $10,000. Thank you. Madam Chair. Senator Port. If I may, to that point, um, while that may be the coalition's uh, way to fundraise, it is not uh, the only people from whom I'm taking uh, advice and suggestions on this bill. A majority of the rewrite in section one is to meet the needs of the cities and counties um, who so far have not signed on in support of the bill. They are obviously advocating for their own concerns, which I understand, um, but we've taken them very seriously. We're also working uh, very closely with law enforcement, the Department of Corrections, the Attorney General's office. Um, this is a, a very comprehensive bill, um, and I have tried to be as comprehensive as possible in taking feedback. Thank you, Senator Port. Um, I know that uh, we have Senator Jaskowski on the list. Uh, and we also need to go into recess. Um, members, uh, are there objections if we move this amendment and adopted it so we've taken that action and coming back then to the line of questioning and the deliberation around the amendment bef uh, this evening? Uh, seeing no objection, then uh, I'll move the A100 amendment. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And those in no. Aye. aye. No. 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 The amendment. Uh, a division has been called for. So all those in favor of the A100, A100 amendment, please raise your hand. Senator McQuaid, do you want to turn on your camera? Victoria in London. 
And those opposed, please raise your hand. There being seven ayes and six noes, the amendment is adopted. Members, uh, I am gonna lay Senate file 73 on the table. And this committee is in recess until approximately 5.30 this afternoon. Uh, members, if you'd like to put your materials back in your brown packet, uh, they will be delivered back to us when we begin committee again this afternoon. Thank you very much, Senator Port. Thank and you. everybody who's been here to testify uh, will take this up again later this afternoon. We're in recess. <laughs>